Imagine an energy plant so incredible. It literally breathes electricity out of the ocean like a living lung. This deep ocean power station taps the sea's heat layers and converts them to power, up to six times more electricity than the same area of solar panels or wind turbines could ever produce. And get this, it's cheaper and runs 24-7 without a pause. Hawaiian researchers built the first prototype and they realized something shocking. The ocean's layers of warm and cold water act just like a giant natural battery. Their plant inhales warm surface water, extracts the heat energy, and exhales cold water deep below, exactly as a human lung draws in oxygen and sends out carbon dioxide. Experts estimate this technology's potential at a mind-blowing 90,000 terawatt-hours per year enough to power all of Europe almost seven times over. It sounds like a sci-fi dream, but here's the kicker. Despite being a concept 150 years old, the first modern plants are only now finally being built. Back in the 1870s, a brilliant French physicist named Jacques Arsenault made an astonishing discovery. He calculated that the world's oceans absorb over a million terawatt-hours of solar energy every single day. To put that in context, the energy needs of humans at that time were far, far lower than today's. So, even then, a million terawatt-hours was a virtually unimaginable amount of energy. Arsenon realized that if only we could tap even a tiny fraction of that heat, we could solve our power problems overnight. In theory, the ocean was a gold mine of energy, but how could you possibly build a power plant that breathed this energy out of the sea? Arsenon dug deeper and found the key. The sun doesn't warm the ocean evenly. The surface, especially in the tropics, heats up to blistering temperatures, think up to 35 degrees Celsius or more, while the deep ocean, down at 1,000 to 4,000 meters, stays just around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius. Because warm water is lighter, the layers never mix. In other words, there's always a huge temperature gap between the warm surface and the cold depths, essentially a natural battery waiting to be tapped. Arsenon W. realized this was the secret ingredient for a revolutionary engine. So, in 1881, he proposed the first-ever ocean thermal energy conversion plant. His design used what's known today as a clausius ranking heat cycle, basically a heat pump submerged in the ocean. Picture this. Giant pipes form a closed loop filled with an organic working fluid like ammonia. Warm surface seawater heats the ammonia, turning it into vapor. That vapor shoots through a turbine, generating electricity. Then, the vapor travels down into the icy depths where it cools and turns back into liquid. It's a continuous loop, or, as Arson and W like to say, a machine that breathes the ocean's warmth to power our lights. It was a radical idea. An engine with no fuel tank, only a steady supply of sunshine-charged water. One of Arsenon's most enthusiastic students was George Clude, a prototype for a modern energy crusader. Clude not only believed in the concept, he acted on it. He spent years refining the design and finally built the world's first working OTEC prototype. When early tests showed it could be cost-effective, Clude even got the green light to build a full-scale plant. In 1930, that plant was erected in Matanzas, Cuba. It was tiny by today's standards, producing just about 22 kilowatts, but at the time, it was nothing short of miraculous. Crowds gathered to see the first power come out of thin air, or rather, out of warm seawater. For a moment, it seemed like a miracle was dawning. This living lab in Cuba demonstrated that our oceans really could run generators continuously. But then, almost overnight, the miracle went missing. As if struck by a curse, that first OTEC plant vanished from history. During its 1930 commissioning, an incredible storm, a real-life hurricane, 
swept through and completely obliterated the facility. The turbines fell silent, and the dream seemed drowned. Undeterred, Clued tried again a few years later in Brazil, 1935, but fate repeated itself. Another storm wrecked the second plant. The pattern was eerie. Just as Otec was about to prove itself, nature tore it down. It's almost conspiracy movie stuff. Two back-to-back -back disasters, erasing a breakthrough technology. Engineers today chalk it up to the technology not being mature enough. Ninety years ago, they didn't have corrosion-proof materials or the knowledge to build seawater heat exchangers strong enough to survive a storm. But one wonders, was it just bad luck? Or was someone, somewhere, quietly relieved that the plan failed? Decades later, in the 1960s and 70s, inventors tried yet again to resurrect ocean thermal power. New designs were drawn up, and construction even started on improved plants. But just as momentum built, the global oil market crashed to record lows. Suddenly, fossil fuels were cheap again. On paper, OTEC was fantastic, but in reality it became unprofitable to pursue at that moment. The oil lobby and economics won out, and the ambitious OTEC projects were quietly shelved mid-construction. Only a few small pilot schemes in the United States sneaked through in that era, mainly as emergency backup plans during oil crises, but none went commercial. By the time Clued and Arsenon W. passed away, both were convinced their ocean power dream would never see the light of day. Fast forward to 2025, and it feels like the tables have suddenly turned. Arsenon and Clued's idea, once forgotten, is now being hailed as one of the most promising ways to generate baseload green power. Ocean thermal energy conversion, often called OTEC, is back with a vengeance. In fact, Hawaii has just brought its first modern plant online. Yes, Hawaii, the birthplace of so much oceanic research, has jumped in. A quick side note, earlier OTEC tests actually ran in Hawaii decades ago, so they have a bit of a head start. Engineers there have built what is essentially a new and improved version of that old Cuban plant, but with 21st century technology, and they're not the only ones. Around the globe, everyone from research universities to big corporations is scrambling to harness this power. Take for example the Netherlands TU Delft, which published studies showing just how massive OTEC's potential could be. They're crunching the numbers on floating platforms, optimized heat exchangers, you name it. Advances in materials, science mean those old problems, salt, corrosion, storms, are being tackled head on. Tech people say we've dramatically extended component lifetimes in seawater, and engineers have slashed construction costs. The result? An OTEC plant can theoretically produce electricity at 3 to 15 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. Those estimates even surprise industry veterans. It's on par with some of the cheapest wind and solar projects out there. And remember, OTEC plants run around the clock. No weather or daylight needed. That 24-7 reliability is an absolute goldmine for factories and data centers that need guaranteed power big players are taking note. For instance, Japanese shipping giant MOL, Mitsui OSK Lines, has quietly made OTEC a top priority. They've partnered with research institutes to build an OTEC demonstration plant in Mauritius. Yes, the island in the Indian Ocean. Their goal? To be flipping the switch on the world's largest OTEC power plant by 2026. Think about that. Within a year, we could see an ocean heat power station bigger than anything the world has ever seen, producing megawatts of constant energy. And it's not just Japan. Companies in the United States and the United Kingdom have their own OTEC projects on the drawing board. A UK firm, Global OTEC, is teaming up with Hawaii's Makai Ocean Engineering to refine the technology. 
American and British navies once looked at OTEC to power remote bases. Now, civilian governments in tropical countries, like those in the Caribbean and Pacific, are eagerly eyeing the tech for energy independence. The common theme, tropical oceans. The bigger the temperature difference between surface and deep water, the more power these plants can squeeze out. In equatorial waters, nature is practically doing half the work. But here's the catch. Whenever a technology looks too good, you have to ask yourself if there's a hidden catch. Oh, TEC enthusiasts point out that even after generating power, the cold, deep water coming to the surface is still pristine and can be used for things like chilling buildings or farming fish. It sounds great, a triple win, electricity, cold water for cooling, and nutrient-rich water for aquaculture. However, the skeptics raise an eyebrow. Messing with the ocean layers might not be without consequences. Consider this. Pumping cold, nutrient-laden water up to the sunlight zone could supercharge plankton blooms and fish populations in one spot, which might seem beneficial for fisheries. But on the flip side, altering the natural temperature gradient could slowly change ocean currents or weather patterns over many plants. Most scientists say small-scale OTEC won't noticeably slow down the Gulf Stream or anything obvious but admit it's a new frontier. The more pressing question is ecological. Those nutrients are meant to stay in the deep. If we bring them to the surface on a huge scale, the ecosystem could shift. Maybe we get more fish, or maybe we get massive algal blooms that choke coral reefs. Right now, it's a debate. No one truly knows until many tests are done. All we do know is that the technology is so promising, many argue the risk is worth taking, as long as we monitor carefully. So at this stage, OTEC looks like a dazzling opportunity with caveats. It could be the green energy revolution that powers island nations and coastal cities, or it could have side effects we can't yet predict. 